In this episode of the Deeper Thinking podcast, we feature an excerpt from Richard Bandorik's insightful comments presented as part of NASA's Convergent Aeronautics Solutions Project in collaboration with Shoshin Works. For the full transcript, check out the show notes where you'll also find a link to the source. So I'm CEO of Field Propulsion Technologies. Uh, my background is electrical engineering and mathematics. And um, 40 years ago, I was involved in a company, um, the uh, part owner that do, used to do reverse engineering. And one of the things that came out of there is some of the NGOs that were trying to reverse, reverse engineer advanced technologies that pinged us to look at some of the stuff they had. And that got me really curious because this stuff was definitely way more advanced than we actually have. So one of the things that ended up is I ended up getting pulled into uh, classified programs. And in there, one of the things I wanted to look at was to see if the U.S. government actually was using these technologies. And it turned out that my conclusion was the U.S. government was not. So from there, I ended up working in a number of different companies. I had a project with DARPA for a while. And what we were trying to do was some of the things we observed that you could have longitudinal forces inside of a, a composite conductors. And these composite conductors um, weren't actually conductors. They were something in between a conductor and an insulator. And they were usually a very complex structure. And some of the things that we explored was if we had very small particles that were very closely spaced and we had a accelerated charge that would go from particle to particle, uh, we could generate an external force or a very large force. And that was like real similar to what NCAR is working on. He's seeing the same effect when they accelerate charges a very short distance, they can generate an external force. Our application that we pres that we pitched to the NSF that we worked with uh, Anna was that we could probably use these forces for propulsion. And we're, in our case, we're not using a say a large capacitor disk. We are using very small nanoparticles, and then we have the, the the charges accelerate inside the particles and then tunnel to the next particle. And then so Anna, uh, we're under phase two right now. Now, some of these other materials that we've looked at, some of the other strange properties that they have is real similar to what Hal's doing. It's if it has some of these materials that were built similarly, and you had them set up instead of being a long, thin antenna, you could put them into a cylinder. So all of a sudden now, for the ends of the antenna, now you have a significant amount of area. And in electromagnetics, what they do is they have something called the gauges. Now, in electromagnetics, what they say is there's no radiation coming out of the ends of an antenna. So in our case, we're pretty sure because some of the experiments that we had done in some of the places I'd been, I'd actually seen what we call electroscalar radiation, which is similar to what Pal's working on. Haller's working on a type of radiation that has uh, no fields. But in our case, we're pretty sure that uh, what comes out of the ends of an antenna, instead of being absolutely nothing or just being potentials, if you were to have an antenna of the right length, um, you could actually see an electric field associated with these potentials. So at that point, instead of using an electromagnetic squid to detect these potentials, now you could probably follow this one potential using an electric field meter. And that came out of work that some of the stuff that we observed when I was working with these NGOs is near some of these craft, electronics would always shut down. And some of the measurements we had done had indicated there was an electric field associated with these types of radiation. And that's where my work has basically gone to today. We've talked to the Air Force, and we think we could probably replicate these type of effects. And some of the things that comes out of this is that we really do have some kind of radiation coming out of the ends of an antenna, which would be a longitudinal radiation. And having an electric field and an oscillating scalar potential also implies there might be another field out there that we can't measure right now. And one of the things that the Air Force has wanted us to do was to see if we could try to measure this other field. And this other field is kind of similar um, to what Chance is observing with some of his effects. We, were, we assume that this field will do things like put a pressure on something or like take a some other device that's measuring, say, a diffraction pattern and be able to move it a little bit. So a lot of our research is really confirming what everybody else seems to be working on here. And for the NSF, our real objective is to be able to take these new metamaterials and try to generate an external force. And internally right now, when we are able to apply a DC current to these materials and we're observing these accelerated charges in these nanocomponents, we can see pretty large forces inside these materials. We're using relatively low currents. And a lot of these materials have somewhat of a high impedance. 
So they do take high voltages. So this is really where a lot of our work's been going on. Oh, and then some of the things with Larry, some of the places I've been, there are organizations, these NGOs did get a lot of that data that you were looking for. But when I looked at the data, I didn't see anything like a nitrogen. So they, the ones that I worked with were trying to figure out how these rather large craft, which we people call triangles, would be able to disappear on a dime. So when we were set up looking at these triangles, when they decloaked and they recloaked, we didn't see anything like that. What we really saw was it appeared to be that these triangles were taking whatever was, an example would be whatever was behind them and actually project, projecting it in front of them, which might be equivalent to taking their light rays and bending it around the actual triangle. Um, and so our conclusion, they were doing something along those lines. They were probably doing it with, with a lot less energy. But some of the conditions we observed them on was a lot of times where they were be observing behind them would be a little different than what we would be observing. So what they would do is we would assume we'd be projecting what's behind them in front of them, but it really wouldn't be quite what we would be seeing. And then we had an idea that we could probably track these triangles because their cloak or whatever they're using to bend the light around them was never going to be exactly the same. So some of that work that I was doing with NGOs uh, was really exciting. But one of the other things that comes out of this is these individuals or whoever this group is that has this advanced technology probably does not want us to reverse engineer what they're working on. So they're probably making, using their methods or their technologies to try to keep us from doing things like reverse engineering or exploring how they work just because of the fact that, that gives them an advantage over us. So a lot of my work uh, really comes out of the work I do with the NGOs, and I think we are on the cusp of actually developing new technologies, because I think we're all here on this group, we're all working all on kind of in the same direction, to where I, I think within five or ten years, a uh, couple of us, or hopefully us, will have new technologies out here that'll change the world, and I think propulsion is one of them. I, I think we're really on the cusp of actually being able to develop propulsion. propulsion. No, it's so, so I'm kind of limited. But, you know, one thing I did notice is looking at some of these materials is they were smart materials. Like one of the things is when they, these materials, you'd be looking at them and you try and reverse engineer them, that they would turn to dust. And then so, and they would do it within a minute or two. And then so you could take the dust and then send it off and get the isotropic analysis done on them. And they did, they were extraterrestrial. But these materials, I mean, we're looking at something that's hundreds of years ahead of us. When you look under a microscope or an electron microscope, you're looking at something that's composed of very small particles that seem to be communicating with one another. So those are the things that, that I've been involved in that, I'm not, that we can talk about. But, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why extraterrestrial materials are not really available to most people is because most of them... Um, are set to um, disintegrate if they get in the wrong hand. No, well, it's the isotropic analysis of the dust that's left behind tells you it's extraterrestrial, at least um, where it was manufactured. But So we're looking at uh, materials that can reconfigure themselves. They are composed of small subunits. So the type of things I looked at were the, something as small as a sliver of metal that had, would reconfigure itself depending on where it was would cloak itself and it would try to blend into the environment. So the ones that this one NGO used to get hold of were the ones that were technically broken. I guess the ones that didn't really function very well. So then you could collect them every once in a while and then try to analyze them. You could do things like split them apart, but they would uh, attempt to uh, find each other or reconfigure. Some of the experiments they did was we took one of those and we put it on a very hot surface of about 3,000 degrees. And what it would do is it cooled the surface around itself. And then when we took the device off and then waited again, we would find that the mass would be reduced by a certain amount. So these are really curious types of materials. So that's how we could kind of tell they were extraterrestrial because these things weren't like decades ahead of us. Yeah, so we were looking at very little things they seem to deposit all over the world. We were estimating there's probably trillions of these things that are deposited, and they have all sorts of functions, which really kind of implies that maybe this group is actually manipulating our species. But they, they, you can still acquire those. You know where to look, look for them. You can find We know how to find them. But yeah, they were, like I was saying, they're more intelligent materials. Like the, these subunits probably were pretty, had computational functionality, right? Because 
they knew what their neighbors were all about and they knew they could reprogram themselves to be something different, right? If they needed to change themselves, 